thank you very much, Raksha, for the kind invitation and very kind introduction. Okay, because you know we have, I have like a little bit restricted time, so I right away start my 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 presenting my research. So I will be discussing about some, let's say, advanced technologies, advanced uh, let's say features of the natural materials which we can, which I was actually applying from time to time. Even still, we are going on, we are doing so many things. Of course, mainly purposes to do solar. Uh, and solar to chemical energy or solar to energy conversion. But of course, meanwhile, we are doing so many other things. So I will just try to go. I have like 30, 35 more slides. So I have like 20 minutes. So I will try to go scroll a little bit quickly just to showcase what few different things uh, uh, we are doing from time to time. And even currently, what kind of research we are being engaged in. Okay, my research domain, because, you know, once you have let's say develop different nanomaterials, functional nanomaterials, of course, you can apply them for so many applications. So in the beginning, I started with water spreading. Still, my main specialty is water spreading. But of course, we are doing so many other things. Let's say related things. For example, CO2 conversion, which also fall under the umbrella of chemical energy conversion. Light harvesting is also like solar energy conversion. Then uh, electrochemical synthesis. Actually, it's just like a device setup. So once you have device ready, so you can apply it. You can extend the application on other things also. Uh, electrochemical sensing, we started like two years ago in Pakistan, biomass conversion. It's also both electrochemical and uh, X electrochemical. Then some related uh, techniques like in situ spectroscopy or spectral electrochemistry and wastewater treatment, things like this. <clears throat> and we are all, like I said in the beginning, we are all doing these things by using this functional nanoscale material, thin films, and all those things and their combinations. <clears throat> uh, actually, the, the, the let's say the uh, uh, motivation of this research is using the renewable sources we have on our Earth or on our planet. Of course, sunlight is one of the most abundant sources. We are almost everywhere in the world, no irrespective of which region, which continent we are. Then we have plenty of water. I'm not talking about drinking water in general. The water is almost present almost everywhere. Exception is only a few deserts which we have in, in different parts of the world. But in general, we have almost water everywhere. Then biomass, most of the part of the world are covered with biomass. Including Pakistan, we have a lot of biomass. Then CO2, CO2 is actually not an abundant source, but when I take CO2, it's like a more like a commodity chemical. So we have CO2, let's say, especially in Pakistan or related countries in, in Middle East also, we have so much powerhouses which are being run with the combustion of uh, this furnace oil or fossil fuels. So when you consider the CO2 combustion, CO2 emission coming from those localized combustion, the amount of CO2 is much more compared to the amount in which we are breathing now, which is around 405 or 10 ppm. So this is how I take CO2 as a commodity or abundant source. Then, of course, we can play around with all these resources using sunlight, primarily, of course, to water uh, spreading to make hydrogen. But, of course, we can do so many other things using CO2 to make different type of synthetic chemical fuels. But this is like my main, in a nutshell, umbrella of my research including the driving course. I will skip this one, why we can make hydrogen. There are so many advantages uh, of hydrogen. I will just skip it. Plus, uh, how you can apply hydrogen as a uh, as a fuel for the car. So we can use hydrogen directly as an internal combustion engine uh, fuel, or we can even use it in a, in a fuel cell as a cold, cam a cold combustion material, which can supply directly electricity. So in both cases, of course, the emission of hydrogen is, all, is, is just zero. So you won't get any uh, burden on the environment. If you combust or burn hydrogen in electrochemical way or chemical way, you just generate uh, pure water, nothing else. Which is just a, a schematic way to present uh, how, what is the, I mean, how, what is the perception of the uh, research if anyone is working on solar energy conversion or anything related to solar energy or solar related things. So this is the spectrum of the solar energy. Let's say if I'm standing or someone is standing in the sunlight, so what we get the shower of sunlight on, on top of us, which is like the more or less entire solar spectrum from zero to roughly like say 3000 uh, nanometer uh, wavelength in nanometers. So if you if you closely look the most of the, the spectrum, the let's say most intense or abundant spectrum of solar light is that which is solved from let's say roughly from 300 to 1000 nanometer. We call it a visible region. So just an advice, of course, for myself plus people listening or following me later, that it's it's best to use the, the abundant part of the solar spectrum, which is, which is the visible spectrum. But of course, for the research, we can play around to see. So this one is just a device concept of what kind of uh, device we can build to do all those applications, which I was discussing in the lab at the very beginning. So once, let's say, we have this type of schematic device, which has the two electrodes, anode and cathode, and they are, let's say, then uh, provided with uh, with with the light harvesting material, donor acceptable to the charge separation, and then in catalytic modules on each side, so we can have oxidation catalyst, 
and on the reduction side we have the reduction catalyst which can do the proton reduction or it can also do the carbon dioxide reduction plus of course like i said in the application we can do organic sensors organic application biomass conversion uh, electrochemical sensing and so many things we can of course extend these applications and again to build these type of device we need these three basic components like a resting charge separator and uh, charge transfer let's say and the catalytic module and then of course most important thing is how you blend different part or each part together to make a synergistic uh, beautiful electronic communication between each segment of the device and of course well, like i said this device you can build by using molecular materials uh, and uh, nanomaterials and in fact i'm working with both of these materials you know, from catalyst to the uh, charge uh, or light arrestor also Okay, now I just quickly uh, scroll through different, uh, different, let's say, instances of, let's say, I start with the work spreading. So in the beginning, we started with the, uh, with the molecular material, different molecular material we developed from time to time. Actually, in a PhD, I developed more than 100 catalysts. But of course, you have to then just track the best to, to report in your, in your data or in your thesis. Pyridine-based complexes between thenium and iridium, and we just immobilize them on the electrode surface to drive them electrochemically for a long time. Even I, I still remember that paper was published in Anwante Chem in 2012. At, at that time, it was the best paper or best results, let's say. Even today, it is like sort of a competitive work uh, in the uh, molecular-based water spreading devices. Plus, we extend this one to thalocyanine, metal thalocyanine. Then, of course, most of my work in recent, let's say, in last six, seven years is on uh, nanomaterials, functional nanomaterials. So, of course, when you assume about uh, any nanomaterial, you have to pinpoint what kind of synth uh, strategies, synthetic strategies you are going to use uh, to develop them. So, in my lecture, my practical or experimental expertise was more in the electrochemical. So, I apply a more electrochemical method in the beginning to develop those nanomaterials. It's also because I was working on thin films, so I wanted to develop those materials right on the surfaces. So, I don't need to separately, uh, let's say, do this step that I will develop the material separately, and then I have to do another step. To blend them to, to let's stick them on the electrode surfaces. So in the beginning, I, I worked with electrode acquisition, anodization. Cradle Simpson, we recently developed like three, four years ago. Uh, spray pyrolysis, solid fluorescences, molecular precursor, which is also sort of electrochemical with hydrothermal method, very conventional method. And CBD, we started just two years ago. So these are just a few examples of uh, what we were doing with electrode acquisition. So we almost covered uh, almost all the elements in the first round transition uh, series in the product table. Plus, of course, silver, we tried with silver, palladium also, so many other materials of water spreading. Of course, we got wonderful results uh, and, and new recipes we developed at uh, that time. Uh, later on, we moved to anodization. Anodization is a little bit different than the deposition. In anodization, you don't need to use the foreign ions in the solution. So just electrochemically control the etch the surface, and then the etch, let's say, uh, material or atoms are deposited back on the electrode surface using the gradient of potential and pH. Uh, we have different examples like uh, silver and copper also. Spray polish is a very simple technique. You just need, uh, need to develop a fine spray and then you need to heat the surface to a certain temperature and then just spray uh, the, the precursor on that surface and then in many cases it quickly ready. Sometimes of course you have to electrolyze it or activate the surface to, to make it a water spreading catalyst. Collateral tensium, again, a very conventional method, but of course, we, we have added a few new touches in it by using the carbonate, CO2 and carbonate technique, which, which bring the pH close to 7, which is very easy then to work and control the collateral phase formation and all those things. Molecular precursor method, in molecular precursor method, you can use the molecules and then in situ convert them into nanoparticles. Like in this case, you can see we developed this uh, iridium oxide nanoparticle and size is as small as 1.7 nanometers. And then, of course, molecular nanocrystals, we work on them. They are very tiny, uh, let's say, molecule-type nanomaterials because inside the core is nanomaterial, but, of course, the surrounding is molecules. So it's very, very difficult to really pinpoint them as nanomaterials or, I mean, we call the material or the molecule. So that's why people use these terms, molecular nanocrystals or molecular nano, uh, nanoscale uh, materials. Okay, so in this case, we have developed these four and uh, six atoms, nickel-based uh, nanocrystals. Then, of course, recently the technique to develop is palladium thin films. Actually, I was working with palladium for many years, but I didn't get any success. But this time, when we developed this CVD based different, let's say, morphological uh, uh, alteration, so we were able to develop a very good, or let's say, one of my best words, and it was published last year also. Then, recently, uh, 
collaboration in someone in Pakistan in these you who developed this wonderful catalyst based on the zinc telluride. And it was a debate, of course, that the telluride based materials are not very stable, but of course, in this instance, we show it is way too stable and it can, uh, I mean, it's easy to make, it's relatively cheap, I would call, because its uh, lifetime is long. So you can use it for effective, even let's say for a long term device application also. Okay, then a few things about solar things we are, solar material we are developing. So we actually, like I said in the beginning, very beginning, I'm mostly uh, working or focusing on colored material because they absorb the solar in the visible spectrum. So I, I'm working with bismuth vanadate, uh, hematite, tantalumicrite, tungsten trioxide, this type of material, which absorb like say, between 5 to 700 nanometer, which is a intense spectrum inside the visible region. So we, of course, make those thin films. And then, of course, pre, uh, preliminary, you do some photoelectrochemical investigations. Plus, when you have success, of course, you then mount the catalyst on top of them. And the catalyst can be, again, molecules. In this case, you can see we develop, uh, we mount a uh, uh, molecular catalyst on, on, on top of pixel vanadate. Plus, of course, we have also uh, some example where we put the, the nanoscale materials on top of the uh, materials, uh, which is solar uh, or light sensitive like then of course we are also extending those applications of this catalysis like said to CO2 directional conversion there's a, there are actually two things two uh, aspects of CO2 one is it's very challenging the research to be very honest but other thing is there, it's, it's more challenging but plus it has more potential also because if you see in this figure that CO2 if you tune the catalyst electrode potential and different condition of course then you can develop you can go towards millions of chemicals starting from CO2 then you can go to so many carbon-based material, including fuels, other organic chemical, polymer, so many things. But this is the beauty of this, uh, this CO2 reduction or conversion project. So in this case, you can see we develop, in, in, on the, because we develop a catalyst, water spring catalyst, which can withstand the CO2 environment. So what we did, we then inline this cobalt-based uh, catalyst with a CO2 reduction catalyst, which was, in this case, uh, copper nanowires, or nano hairs, let's say. It was copper, copper oxide, or Oxide derived copper nanowire, let's say. And of course, we got very good uh, conversion efficiency for CO2 to CO and forming acid. Then, of course, we, we are also extending this application to use some light uh, or sensitive material to do photosynthesis CO2 conversion. So you can see this lanthanum dysprosium tin based material. Of course, the efficiency was not so high, but the beauty is this catalyst can directly convert CO2 into methane gas, which, which has, of course, a directly application, but of course, then. Uh, next is to improve the efficiency so that at least we can make that much the, uh, the methane gas that we can apply it in the, in the, in the let's say, for household applications or even uh, to the CNG based internal combustion in there. Then biomass, I said in the beginning, actually this, this project is more or less like using the biomass because biomass is developed using solar energy. So this project was to use biomass to, to develop plastics which are alternative to pet plastic which we are commonly using nowadays. And our target was uh, to use biomass, biomass derived material. For example, uh, we can use uh, uh, ferron based materials, ferron or sulfur based material, let's say, and then we can make oxidize them to make ferron dicarboxylic acid, which can it replace the terephthalic acid in the pet plastic which we are using today. And of course, it's thing glycol, which is also used in the pet plastic. We can even get a thing glycol from the biological sources like cellulose or sugar alcohol, which also comes from the biomass source. And the beauty of this new plastic, which is PEF polyethylene ferrite, is it, it's almost 100% biodegradable and recyclable, which is a big problem or big issue with the pet based plastic. So, and then of course, further extension of the research, we are also doing from time to time this institute of spectroactive chemistry. I was in the beginning working with Norman and FTI, but of course, you can apply more spectroscopy because I still remember when I was at Max Plant, I even worked with the time resolve, uh, 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 picosecond and femtosecond, not well, femtosecond nanosecond and picosecond uh, laser spectroscopy also, absorption spectroscopy also. But in this case, we have developed this in situ Raman. So we, we, we let's say, uh, develop certain surfaces which can enhance the Raman signal. Then, of course, on the molecular level or atomic level information, whatever you are uh, going to, let's say, do on the surfaces, you can, in some cases, monitor uh, from, let's say, through, through the scan of this uh, spectroscopy by using this inline uh, technique. It's a very wonderful technique, I mean, wonderful technique, very helpful technique. And I don't think just still today in anyone has developed this technique in Pakistan. Actually, I was trying it, but because I was on and off, so still, let's say, two things were going on with you know, the United States, United States. So let's see. Then, of course, uh, because I have two, three minutes left, so this is like sort, sort of uh, more, more or less final slides. 
electric chemical sensing. So we started this project three years ago using different materials we, we were developing for even other applications also. So in this case, we developed this nanoscale gold or nano uh, texture gold surface, which was wonderfully, uh, let's say, applicable to detect arsenic in the beginning, but of course, uh, plus we are extending also its application for lead, nickel, copper, uh, mercury, and related things. And of course, the beauty, uh, I mean, in our selling case, which the paper has already been published last year in Insects Omega, we got the sensitivity or detection, detection limit, let's say, or sensitivity as small as uh, 0.1 ppb, which is 10 of the, which is one uh, phase to power minus 10 of uh, uh, minutes. So I will just, yeah, this is just like two other related application we are doing, uh, like using this, this that, that's a setup for my expertise. Running electrolysis, then uh, smart windows, electrochromic uh, effect or factors in the smart window, then of course, all electric cars, these type of concepts, because these are like, you know, not like real lab projects. These are like more like workshops or uh, big practical projects. So, uh, like I said, I was on and off. So, still, of course, these projects are in my mind and somewhere they are, they are sitting. So, I'm very good, very thinking because I'm, uh, now we have this COVID period. So, most of the things are seized now. But I'm of, of course, meanwhile planning also. So as soon as we have this opening of the country in terms of education and research, I'm going to restart this abandoned or let's say halted project very soon. So in the end, of course, whatever I have presented, uh, it, it, it won't be possible without the let's say the contribution of all these people, universities, research grants, research institution, and everything. What I was getting from time to time. So this is like my 10-year journey of the research and all those things. So I'm really grateful to all these universities research centers, people associated, money and everything. And also thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much. Thank you Dr. Pulam for your nice and uh, comprehensive talk. Is there any question? The house is open for question. Is there any question? Oh, Dr. Pulam, I just have a quick question. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. What's the maximum efficiency for your devices you have got? And uh, what's the practical, uh, I mean, for the industrial requirement for that efficiency? You know, to be very honest, if, if for the hydrogen-based device, if you say in terms of, uh, let's say, how much hydrogen it can produce with respect to economy, the U.S. Department of Energy, like three, four years ago, in fact, 10 years ago in the beginning, but then in 2015, 16, they set our target for these type of device uh, that if the device can produce 10% efficiency, fuel efficiency, not, um, I'm not talking about the, uh, the, the catalytic efficiency, it's from solar to hydrogen efficiency. So if let's say a device has 10% efficiency, it roughly means that the device is producing hydrogen uh, with, with price less than $2 per kg which is like currently, uh, let's say, compact competition or meetup for the hydrogen price, which is now around 2 to $3 per kg in USA. So, but at present, my devices and many other people who are working now, we reach about 6 to 7% efficiency, let's say, with cheap materials. Of course, with expensive material like triple gen solar cells, uh, 3-5 uh, solar cell, all those things, efficiency has crossed 20%. But of course, with the cheap technology, it's still hanging around 6 to 7% efficiency. I heard many people, I mean, of course, last two years, there's a big hump now. And many people, of course, are, have developed different devices where they have combination of expensive plus cheap material. And they have shown, of course, 10 per, like 10% plus efficiency. So you can see in general, we are very close to that mark where these things can go to the commercialization. But on the other hand, of course, if we talk about only uh, a photoelectrochemical system in any country, of course, it's a one-time investment. So once you have solar cell ready, of course, the rest of the device and everything becomes cheap. Because all these components like catalyst device components, they are so cheap material, or they are long lasting material. I mean, you can set up a device, and it can run for, for, for months, for weeks, for let's say for a few years or something. Like so, in a way, it's very much practical, or let's say it's going to become a practical very soon. Yeah, with respect to cars and all things, it's a, it's a little bit different thing. The car, they are different, but they are, let's say, two, three concepts. While we are planning technology on the car, one is we can set up a solar based hydrogen pump station where you can recharge your car from hand. My, my concern is more that you can develop this technology built in within a car so that you can tune on whenever you want to use the fuel. The car will start emitting fuel, and then you can directly use that fuel, like, let's say, for hydrogen to run your car out of the vehicle. It's like a uh, mixed concept. 